So let's continue on our discussion. So last time we talked about uh, the deep sea and uh, wanted to uh, segue back a little bit and talk about um, some of our one example of the kind of management issues we have when we talk about our pelagic world. And so to start off this conversation, I want to talk a bit about waste. But before we get into that, into the waste streams in the ocean, <clears throat> I wanted to first uh, get your guys' takes on this. So <clears throat> one of the questions you're currently asking the public that you guys are canvassing, <clears throat> uh, you know, we're asking them to rank some some of these threats. Now, in past years, we've asked uh, this in several different ways. This year, we're asking it um, in, in a, a little bit uh, slightly uh, less number of questions, but the same idea is there. So the question is, <clears throat> in terms of, let's say, the overall functioning, the overall dynamics of the ocean and our coastal systems, what do you guys think? How, how would you guys rate these, um, these four broad categories of threats? No one, no one perceives any threats. That's good. <clears throat> so pollution. Okay, so got to vote for pollution. Okay, and why? Why would you say pollution is number one threat? Or <clears throat> sure. Sure, 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 sure. So. Okay, so we got, let's, let's, let's throw this down on here. So we got, um, so we got uh, broad-based, is that, is that right? Am I, am I correctly interpreting what you guys are saying? So broad-based, okay, and then, and then, what was the, it's just so ubiquitous, is that the idea? Just yeah. everywhere? Everywhere. Universal th threat in space kind of thing. Okay, so what else? What are other ideas? <clears throat> I mean, for, for arguments for pollution being a big threat, or other things, or what? What do you guys think? So, so you're saying you think these three fit together? Oh, okay, so pollution invasive species, and uh, why? Because invasive species aren't supposed to be there. Okay, so this is the notion of something that's not supposed to be there, this is the notion of something that's not supposed to be there. And then destruction and fragmentation goes hand in hand with overhauling. And, and, and this is removing something that is quote unquote supposed to be here, and this is removing something that's supposed to be there. Okay. Okay. And, and, and which one, what do you think's the greatest one? So, so, yeah, the greatest threat. The pollution invasion, invasion one, or, the, or these guys? And why over harvesting? Um, just because I, I don't know, I think um, when you go to like Oregon, <laughs> you get this. Oh no, an Oregon yeah. argument. Okay, right. So like just a drive through Oregon and you really start to see like what, what it really looks like on a large scale. Just trees, they chop down all the same age and the same size. And, um, so Oregon forestry gives gives you pause okay all right that's an interesting argument but all right what uh, what, what other what are the other arguments do we have for for why over harvesting is what specifically about fisheries so you think bycatch is a big problem Ah, okay, so that's what, that's what we're going to talk about in a second. So the, so, so the notion of it's really hard to quantify <clears throat> any one person's impact or, any, or the impact on any one element of the system. Right, I agree, that's really a really challenge, but we're going to think about how we can maybe do that. But, but right, so, so that, that argument says that all, you know, figuring out which of these is the greatest threat is a hard thing, and, and it is a hard thing. But I'm trying to figure out, as the first step, let's figure out some, some examples of ways that we could uh, or, or arguments why one of these things might be uh, ra might be raise, rising to the top of these threat 
lists. Michaela, what do you think? Okay. 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 So this notion of um, maybe sort of uh, a threshold, threshold um, that has great ramifications, something like that, right? That that you. Uh, I mean, tell, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just trying to paraphrase what you said, but yeah, right. Okay, so messing with uh, uh, function, functioning, Jesus, functioning of the system. Okay, sure. I think that's right. Although I think you can make that argument for all these things, right? The invasive species would mess with the system. Pollution would mess with the system. So, so I'm not saying that that's not true, but but. See if you guys can give me arguments why one of these things would maybe rise to the top. That's distinct. That's distinct from, from what could be happening if the other, uh, other threats are going on. Does anybody think invasive species are, are one of the greatest threats to our coastal or, or ocean environment? No. Okay. Is anybody so so show of hands who thinks that over harvesting or or, or let, let's just say maybe <laughs> let's not, it's early in the morning I can tell people are like drinking eating their pretzels and getting <laughs> getting up to speed I understand um, but so so possibly you know possibly the number one threat uh, who says invasive species possibly no one okay who says over harvesting so it looks like maybe a bit maybe more than half of us think that could be one okay what about destruction or fragmentation. Okay, a, a, a very small percentage. And how about pollution? Okay, a little bit more, but so it looks like over-harvesting is what you guys are, are focusing on. So give me some specific reasons why over-harvesting might be. Um, you know, something you guys read, maybe a specific uh, fact or a specific observation or... It's like the abalone. We just kept getting worse and worse. That's okay. Serial yeah. depletion of... Uh, California abalone species. Okay, good. And we don't eat abalone anymore, right? I told you guys a story about how when I was young, we used to go and the whole thing was the whole family would go and we'd get abalone. And even when I was in graduate school, we, um, we, we ate abalone and we can't, at least in Southern California, wild collection, we can't do that anymore. Good. What are some other reasons why over-harvesting might be a... But, Okay, but, but, but I agree, but, but isn't that a problem for all these things? So, so, so what you're arguing is that, um, that, that we essentially have a finite resource, but we treat it, at, at least in theory, as if it's infinite or potentially infinitely replace, um, uh, renewable. Um, okay. So maybe something in there was about the rate of removal. Maybe rate, maybe rate and scale, maybe what you were talking about, maybe? Rate and scale of removal, okay. What else? Okay, so pollution and invasive species are a consequence. That nobody sets, or few people set out to pollute yeah. or set out to release invasive species, but it's sort of an a uh, knock-on effect of something else? Yeah, as opposed to like destruction and fragmentation of the harvesting, you have like direct impacts of... Um, okay. Okay, so, may, okay, so th th this might be more of an um, indirect, maybe, uh, impact. And maybe this guy is an indirect impact. Maybe. Maybe we'll 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 uh, we'll look at some stuff in a little bit to see if we think it's indirect. But 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 okay for now possibly indirect, in, in, uh, indirect or maybe we could also say unintended. I think in reality, if you talk to most people, do you want to over harvest? Do you want to destroy? I think everybody would say none of these or most adults would say we would never intend to do all these things. Even even people that you might characterize as as you know not caring about the stuff. I think even they would generally not say they wanted to spoil something, right? Um, usually. 
Uh, okay, so uh, so give me give me a couple, one or two more arguments and we'll go on. Give me one or two more. Give me an argument for inv- why invasive species might be. You know, even if you don't agree with it, what's a what's a potential explanation or potential justification for pushing it high in the rankings? Right. Right. So one one term that's come into, uh, you know, so we we people that work in environmental science, organismal biology, a lot of times we use words that everybody thinks they know. Right. We tend to not use the word quark, gluon, muon. Right. That that's that's the crazy physicists invent all this stuff. Right. And nobody knows what the hell they're talking about ever. So then they feel all super smart and they just can talk about what they want. Right. We use things like pollution, competition, those kind of things that, that are terms that we have some familiarity with outside of you know, environmental science or outside of the natural world context. And so, so, um, so because of that, there seems to be sometimes um, uh, a drive uh, for, for some of us to invent new terms. And one of the new terms that was coined a few about a decade or so, a decade or two ago, was this notion of ecosystem engineers or, or ecosystem engineer. And, um, and it actually seems to be a fairly good one. It wasn't, it wasn't just a, somebody trying to get a paper and somebody trying to get a job and you know, make a news splash, but it actually does seem to be a good description of several things. And most, most uh, obviously, invasive species. So this notion of what, what we were just talking about there is this, this species comes into say one of our coastal watersheds and by nature of its biology one and then by the nature of its ability to essentially proliferate and go to very high numbers in the community a very high you know abundance of individuals they can radically change the bio geophysical cyclings or goings on in those systems and so the one obvious case is water right they can draw down the water table um, in other cases, we could we could change how water flows around harbors or in or in reefs or, or things of that nature. So yeah, so okay, so, this, so that's an argument. That invasive species, not every not every invasive species in, is is an ecosystem engineer, but the most problematic ones tend to be what we would now describe as an ecosystem engineer. Okay, so that's a good one. How about uh, yeah? How about another argument for I don't know destruction or fragmentation. So if we fully knew how to do ecological restoration, right? If we knew how to come in and, and, and replace these systems, we could reverse these these uh, these impacts. And in some cases, we can, um, but not always. Not always. So um, whereas some of these things, like pollution, the answer might be to stop pollution, stop polluting, maybe, and that would maybe take care of the problem. With other things like destruction or fragmentation, the the going back to the previous state is not necessarily easy. Um, okay, good. Any other arguments you guys want to toss out there? With the Maryland, uh, uh-huh. Oh, good. Yeah, good question. So what do you guys think? So the groins on the Maryland coast, do you think that would fall into the destruction fragmentation? Yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, um, so, so, th- so that one's interesting. So not to get into restoration theory or anything, but um, what I've found over the years is that the higher energy the system, the easier it is to restore it. So, so in that case, so we're talking about there, right, are those groins along the Maryland coast that we put in to alter the sediment movement around uh, a headland, basically. And then we ended up robbing the sand from the national park down, uh, down current, right? But uh, you know, th- that restoration is fairly easy in the sense that we just blow up or, or physically remove those groins and over the course of a season or a couple seasons, that sand will, will return to its movement pattern and go back and start to, and start to build up again on that national park. So that, that would be an example of a relatively easy restoration. You just, you just remove this disturbance. Um, so yeah, so, so, but that, that is an example of that, that one action degrading and, and or fragmenting the the coastal environment, so good. Other thoughts? Okay, so there we go. So, th- so here's some, some arguments. I don't know if the, so I, w- I would maybe swipe the, or scratch the Oregon forestry example. I, 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 like, I like where you're going with you, but, but that wasn't exactly, I mean, sure, okay, anyway. Um, so a show of hands. So if you guys just had a pick right now after this discussion and what you guys have been thinking about, 
Um, what you guys think the number one threat is, if, if you know, I force you to pick one, uh, show of hands, who would say pollution? Okay. Who would say over harvesting? Okay. Who would say destruction, fragmentation? Okay. And who would say invasive species? Okay. So invasive species got no votes. Pollution got no vote. Wait, right? No, did anybody vote for pollution? I think nobody voted for pollution. Right. Yeah, so no, pollution and invasive species got no votes, and it was pretty much split roughly 50-50 between over-harvesting and destruction. Uh, this data is not the most recent. We have, we have another uh, two years of data uh, I could show you, but it'll make the point. So this is what we've found over the last, uh, this is not quite a decade of, of our polling in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and L.A. County. So here we go. We have... Um, uh, pollution, sorry, let's, let's start with this guy. Pollution is red, over harvesting is purple, habitat fragmentation is green, and invasive species is blue. And the fisheries question uh, is, uh, we, we sort of broke it up a little bit more and had a couple different variants in addition to just generic pollution. We had ocean acidification, which is one subset of pollution from, from uh, carbon uh, dioxide dissolving in the ocean. And then uh, associated increased temperatures of waters, uh, also related to climate change. So, so these are kind of subsets of pollution. But, but um, so fisheries asks, had uh, more than those four categories. But effect on the coastal environment, effect on coastal wetlands uh, has those four. And so this is what you see. And this is incredibly stable. So this is a mean, and this is a standard error over you know, looking at the data across many years. And so, again, the idea here is if we ranked, if we scored this as number one, that would be the greatest threat. And if we scored it as number four, or in the case up here of six, that would be the, that would be a comparatively low threat. So big problem on the left of the screen, not a problem on the right side of the screen. And what we see is, check it out, here's the, here's the, the average score, and then the, the standard error is very small. For most of these, most of these things, it's, it's not, from year to year to year, there's huge consistency um, amongst uh, people's answers. So maybe it goes up a, a you know, slight percentage or down a slight percentage, but it is pretty solid. And, and when you go back and look at old data, the people have done this in the 80s or the 70s, and that, this is pretty, pretty much pollution always wins. Pollution always wins. If we ask people what's, what's wrong, pollution. Pollution, pollution, pollution. So why might that be? Well, why do you guys think? That, so you guys argued uh, the, let's see, in, in this graphic, you guys argued that the green and the pur purple were big, but not that many people seem to agree with you. Yeah. I think there's like a huge, like, meat. Right. You know, so, so some things have clear and obvious upsides, mm -hmm. if only to a relative few people potentially, but nevertheless, there are clear upsides. Other things are maybe like pollution, hard to argue for the upside. Although apparently a lot of people love to argue for the upside of climate change, uh, so but but you know um, that, that 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 is interesting, right? And the and the reason why climate change, the debate is that way, is because people have pumped billions and billions of dollars into active misinformation campaigns, right? Probably understanding that uh, they needed to do that, right? Otherwise otherwise people would go down sort of Mandy's argument of saying like, what's the upside? I, um, I, when I talk about climate change, I usually put this picture up and um, um, of this uh, village. We're doing this one survey out in uh, near the Iranian border, the Turkish border of Iran, and and we're doing something and we're having lunch in this kebab shop. And um, and my back was the television. There's like a tele There's always a television in these places. And there's a television up on the corner of the shop, and my back was to it. And we're eating, eating, and all of a sudden. Everybody gets quiet, and this is maybe like 10 years ago. And everybody gets quiet, and they look up at the screen. And I was eating like a falafel thing or something like that. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. So it took me a minute to turn around, so I kind of turn around. And there's a guy talking. And so, you know, the, the newscast was just reading, so I couldn't tell. I don't really speak Turkish. So I couldn't, I couldn't tell what, what they were talking about. And so I asked the guy, I said, what's going on? Because they're, they're, they're always blowing up stuff. They're blowing up the roads we drive on and all this kind of stuff. So, oh my, is there another, was there another uh, PKK attack or whatever? And they said, no, no, no. Uh, I said, oh, is there like a soccer thing or something? Or, no, no, no. I said, there's a story on climate change. And so the thing that got everybody to shut up 
in this rural, you know, out of the way place was a story on climate change. And when they would put a soccer, a, a sports story up or whatever, nothing quieted the crowd, at least that day, anywhere close to this climate change story. And so that started us having a conversation. And what a lot of folks there told me was, uh, you know, the Iraq war was obviously burning. It still is, but it was burning very brightly then and a lot of issues and, and a lot of disagreement with, for example, um, perceived American ideas of stuff. And they said, we get the Iraq war. We totally understand that. You guys wanted oil, right? So whether that, that view is correct or not, they, they could sort of see that. Like, we get you guys are coming over here to try and take this thing, right? You want to you want to be the big man. You want to take that stuff. But what we can't understand is we don't understand. There are two things I understand why we didn't join, the, why we wouldn't join the international criminal courts, which prosecutes war crimes, and why we wouldn't, you know, sign on to the Kyoto Protocol. Why we wouldn't, why we wouldn't do that? Because because they they literally said, what's the upside? Like nobody wins in this, right? There there's no, there's there's no. I mean, maybe there's some rich guy that owns a whatever, and maybe that guy's going to make a little bit of money for a few decades. But but from a societal standpoint, there's no upside. So that's so that's uh, an important consideration. What else? So what are some other? Or can you guys think of any other explanations as to why pollution seems to win out in the public sentiment like this? Right. 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 So, so I, I think so. There's a couple things there. So, just to summarize, what you're just saying I think there's this issue of um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't pollute, and, and that's and that's another one of these we've talked about this before. It's another one of those things where those guys over there should not be polluting, right? It, it's it's it's. I mean, you can make this argument with several of these things, but with pollution in particular, I think it's relatively easy for someone to say, take their, take their waste from dinner and put it in the garbage can and say, look, I did my part, right? So, there, so the, the bar to thinking that you are not part of the problem is relatively low. And you can actively do something right now, right? Changing ocean acidification, changing over harvesting, that's a little hard to do in the next five minutes, right? But we could take our... our bag of pretzel, you know, the, the bag that has our pretzels in over there and go put it in the recycling bin or something and think that, ah, oh, we, we made a difference. We did not pollute, right? So there's this sort of low bar to entry and low bar to thinking that, that you're, you're part of the problem. Or, 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 or let me say, an easy way to get out thinking that you're not part of the problem. Cool? All right, so with that in mind, uh, let's, do, let's do a thought experiment. I, wanted, I want you guys to think about... Um, uh, so we have these things. And so clearly all these things are a significant issue for us. Significant problem. Pollution, over-harvesting, etc. How, how might we go about creating a, at least something of a fair rubric, a fair uh, a measuring tool to look at these things and determine which one is the greatest? So how can we, how can we go about doing a fair assessment of what is, let's, let's, say, let's say the Ventura County Coast. Well, let's pick something tangible. Let's say our Ventura County Coast. So um, how might we create an objective way to go out and measure the impact, let's say, of these various factors, and then, and then in turn be able to figure out which one really is the greatest? So maybe that's too hard. Maybe you could pick. So how about how might, how might we go figure out if pollution is an issue for us? Maybe let's take them one by one. Water quality, and so and what would you look for specifically? Like like nutrients. Yeah, and Pagus okay. Creek is pretty damn polluted and it's flowing into the ocean, so see the effects of that river has. Okay, so one we could look at pollutant. So so measure pollutants. Measure uh, chemicals. Nutrients, uh, temperature, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, like amount of you know trash you find on the beach. Trash on the beach. Okay, good. So 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 that then we could do a physical, or, or we could say large, large trash. You could 
also do um, like what kind of um, like businesses like so in, in terms of like point source and non point source you know pollution so like okay okay so, so the source so figure yeah. out who, where the source of pollution is mm. or sources identify the sources so like if there's like a power plant you know right there by the beach so like Ormond you know okay are they so, okay stuff? Okay, so again, sources, emissions sources, so we, or, 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 or not just emissions, but, but pollutant, the place where the pollution is or originating. Okay, good. How about, how about over harvesting? How, how might we look at over harvesting on our Ventura County coast? Uh, okay, so, so, so population numbers. Okay. So population size. Do you look at historic data to see if they used to fish and what they're getting now? Yeah. Okay, good. So so historic historic diversity and abundance maybe. Versus now. Okay, good. What else, how else can we measure um, over harvesting? Talk to people. That are like fishing, you know, along our coast, and maybe you know they, you know, generations of their family, you know, have been, you know, there. So we could do that. Mm -hmm. Let's not do that. Yeah. We could do that because this is we're trying to come up with an objective rubric, and we could ask that for every. We, we could, and that, that's a fine thing. To, in fact, that's what you guys are doing in a sense with this with the survey instrument, right? You're going out and saying, hey. Uh, is this a problem? Do, what do you think about that? And that's, that's a fine thing to do, but that wouldn't be unique to over harvesting. So, so, so far for over harvesting, we have to go out and measure the, the sizes of the population or the, you know, the number of critters that we have now. Maybe look at the, the current diversity or the current abundance of these communities and, and compare them to what they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, etc. Other Okay, so some, some measure of, of uh, uh, geography, geography of removal. So is it the case that people are always going to spot A, spot B, spot C, or do they go to different places, you know, is it just sort of all over the place any old day? Okay, other thoughts? Because those are some things we can do with over harvesting. What about uh, invasive species? Our blue, our blue dot here. What, what are some ways we could quantify the 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 problematicness, the the issues of um, an invasive species in the Ventura Coast? Okay, so we, we could do surveys again. So we could do population size. We can do um, and and just uh, uh, inventorying, inventory and monitor for numbers and types. Okay. Other other ideas for the invasive species. Okay. You can find because some invasive species, like you said, they don't they don't really cause a problem, but the the ones that do have like a, a way to explain it to someone. Okay. Like using up this much brown water. Okay, so this notion yeah. of an impact, this yeah, notion of that, the actual. Impact. Okay, good. I want to return to that in a little bit, but that's good. Other thoughts? Okay, then let's talk about uh, our last one, which is our la last major category, which is habitat fragmentation. How, how might you guys, how might we go about starting to assess if habitat fragmentation is an issue? So okay, so one we can just say um, uh, uh, mortality if we see a lot of de things dying. 
elevated mortality. Okay. What about just what we did before with this, this notion of, um, for example, Michaela said with regards to over harvesting, where people are harvesting, maybe just where are their grasslands? Where are their forests? Where are their kelp forests? Where are their seagrass beds? That kind of stuff. So maybe just mapping, mapping distribution of communities. And just like before, we talked about the historic versus now, you do the same thing. We can maybe see what the distribution of the kelp forests were in the 1950s, maybe what they were in the 1970s, maybe what they were in the 1990s, maybe this decade, something like that. Um, I was thinking maybe of like percent, like percent human impacts and then like man-made habitat. Uh, you mean percent like, like human-dominated systems kind of thing? Yeah, so like if you have a wetland, Right. Okay. Like how much of that? Okay. So, so, so anthropogenic versus natural. Anthropogenic versus natural landforms, or, or you know, uh, aerial extent of the landscape, kind of thing, or seascape. Good. Other thoughts? All right. Great. So these are all good ideas. These are all great starts. Now. Um, that's great. So we have some, some ways to potentially measure if we have invasive species, some ways to maybe measure if we have some pollution going on. But then the key question is, and so the answer is yes to all these things, right? Yes, we have overharvesting. Yes, we have habitat fragmentation of invasive species pollution. Okay, good. Cool. So, so the first thing is, are these things happening? And I can tell you with confidence, since, since I and or we have gone out and measured this stuff, and there's at least at least a problem with every single one of these things in at least one area of our county. So check. So the first thing, is it happening? Check. Now the question becomes, uh, let's, make it, let's just try to make an apples to apples comparison, right? So, so right now we have all these great things and we went out and we said, ah, there's, there's, uh, there's some nutrients in the water and there's some bunch of guys that go out every weekend and go put their fishing hooks in the same exact place and everything, so that's cool. But then what does that mean? So is, is the fish hooks, are the, are the guys with the fishing pressure the same as the same impact on the ecosystem or the community as the nutrient enrichment? So, so how might we, let's do this. Let, let's, let's, take, let's take five minutes. Let's do, you guys have one table and Michaela, why don't you join these guys on this table. And let's just take five minutes and you guys brainstorm. Brainstorm how we might be able to do that. So, so, you know, using all these factors or other ones, but how might we create a common rubric or a common way to assess the degree of problematicness of each of these different factors? I, I'll, start my, I'll start my magic stopwatch. So, so just, just to be clear, my question is, um, how, can we, how can we objectively assess these four factors at the same time or, or at the same, yeah, you get it, same, in the same community in Ventura County. Ready, set, go. Shrimp. Shrimp. <laughs> the, the vast uh, uh, Ventura County shrimp population. Okay, good. Well, I think our shrimp population is screwed. Um, but uh, okay, okay, so shrimp, all right, so some, some near shore sh uh, crustacean, all right, cool. And so you guys are gonna talk about the monetary value and, 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 how, and, and uh, walk me through that. So how would I measure the monetary value of pollution on shrimp? Because they're rare, more rarer. Okay. So, okay. So, so, so I like I like that thought. Like how you, that that road you guys are going down. Uh, 
turns out it's it's actually um, we need to be careful of those arguments because a lot of times so what all the economic theory show one time I was talking with this I was at this conference in I don't know I wasn't in Paris but the guy was from France uh, I don't remember where it was anyways somewhere and I went to this talk and I heard this per person give a talk about the exact thing you guys were just talking about about trying to put a dollar sign on on uh, some different uh, species and he, it's an interesting talk and and good talks you don't just walk away from going, that guy was brilliant. A lot of good talks you walk away from, from come from saying, that guy was stupid, right? But it inspired you to think about things and like, that guy's such a fool. If I was doing it, I would clearly do X, Y, and Z, right? And, and that's a good, that's, that's a great, that's a great, you know, intellectual discussion, right? We've stimulated the next level of thinking. We've stimulated the next thing. And so that's why I was walking out of this thing going, that was a good talk, but ah, that's, that was, and I'm talking to this guy. And I said, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it was cool. I said, and he's like, oh, I found it very interesting. I said, oh, no, it was very interesting. So there's this great paper. I don't know if you've seen it, but it, uh, these guys, I don't remember their names, but uh, they're, they're uh, French, and they're doing this stuff in the zoo, and I described this whole experiment. The guy said, yeah, that was my, that was my project. <laughs> I was like, oh. Like, thank God I didn't say the guy was stupid or something. Right? <laughs> but um, but so, so they did a lot of interesting things. For example, um, in zoos, where there's a relatively low, so the, the the dollar signs we're talking about are not necessarily massive, right? But they're but but they're um, if essentially saying if we put an endangered sign by an exhibit and see how many people go to the endangered sign, and if we take the endangered sign away the next day and see how many people go to that, and then if we start doing things like for example put barriers to make it harder to get to whatever. So they did things like let, left a garden hose in between, you know, just laying on the ground one day. And then they sort of let the garden hose, left the garden hose running, right? So it'd be hard to do that experiment here in California right now, but, but right, leave it running. And so you can still walk to the exhibit, but it's, you know, you got to go through a little puddle and it's just, oh God, you got kids in Australia, I really don't want to go there. And so, so by doing all these manipulations, what they show clearly is the rarer the thing is, the much more people value it. And that's completely borne out by all the data on the prices of butterflies. As butterflies become endangered, their price per, per, um, per butterfly goes up. We see it with eggs, with egg collectors, all these things. So, so, um, so I like what you guys are talking about, the economic impact. But, but that, that's one that might be a... Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's... Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes when we make something rarer, it makes it more valuable. And in fact, most times it does. And so, so that might, you know, that might mess a little bit with your calculations. But I like, okay, okay, but, that, okay. but anyway, so you're talking about some kind of valuation. And so you, you'd say, oh, the, the, a, a shrimp cost X number of dollars today. And then maybe we had the, the refugio oil spill. And then we go into the market the next week and say, hey, how much does it cost this week, right? With the idea that it'd be polluted. And is that what you guys thinking? Okay. Okay, cool. Well, so, so, so uh, and other, other thoughts, other ideas you guys had to go about figuring things out? Okay, so there's two basic ways we could go about doing this. One, we could do this, this exercise that I was kind of sending you guys down on, which is simply saying, let's go out and measure everything under the sun. All right, let's measure all these things. And then we would have one unit of pollution. We have to decide what that is, right? But, but one more unit of pollution and see what that does to the shrimp, let's say. And then we'd go and we'd add one more unit of destruction of kelp forest or whatever. See what that does to the, to the uh, critter. Um, or you do the same thing, but you do it through time. And so you say, oh, back in the 50s, you know, we had this many fish and the, and the kelp bed was this extensive. And now we've reduced it by 50%, has the shrimp population reduced by 50% or, you know, so you do that kind of stuff. So that's one approach. Another approach is to use more of a first principles type thing. And this is what I think most people tend to do. First principles is we can't, we, we don't have a, or it's very difficult to come up with a standard rubric that measures pollution at, on the same scale as over harvesting as on the same scale as invasive species, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So instead what we do is we go out and we say, hey, uh, is this stuff present, right? Is this, say, pollution happening? Yes, no. Okay, check, good. And then, um, is a, does a little bit of this pollution have a huge impact? Or is this factor being felt 
by a wide swath of things. And the idea is we do that with pollution, we do that with overharvesting, we do that with invasive species, then we, we sit down and we kind of have a, what's called a best professional judgment type model and we come together and we go, ah, yeah, so I, I think this one's much more, much, much more problematic, okay? So uh, we'll come back and we'll start talking about one of these. Let's, let's take a 10 minute break since you guys have been sitting here for a bit. Let's take a 10 minute break and we will pick this up uh, talking about pollution.